I am so glad you're here because today we're going to learn all about amines in organic chemistry. Amines are indispensable compounds in biology, pharmaceuticals, and industry. They are essential components of biomolecules like proteins and neurotransmitters, crucial in drug development, and versatile in agrochemical applications, making amines fundamental to advancements in healthcare, technology, and everyday products. First, let's begin by classifying amines. Amines are compounds derived from ammonia, which has a chemical formula of NH3. If we are to replace the N to H bonds with different organic substituents, this gives rise to primary, secondary, and tertiary amines. So if we place an alkyl group at one of the nitrogen to hydrogen positions, this generates a primary amine where the other two substituents are still hydrogen atoms. Now, if instead we're to replace two of those hydrogens with organic substituents, and the R is just meant to indicate any sort of alkyl chain, then we get a secondary amine. And finally, if we're to replace the final substituent with different organic groups, so for example, we could call all of them methyl groups, then we would say that this is a tertiary amine. A primary amine is a compound that contains an NH2 group connected to a single alkyl chain. Here are several different examples of primary amines. Notice, though, that the complexity of the alkyl chains is very different in each of these examples. And in fact, UPAC recognizes two different nomenclatures for determining the nomenclature for primary amines. In the two examples on this side of the screen, you see relatively straightforward alkyl groups. In fact, this one is just a simple ethyl group, so it is actually called ethyl amine. And then on this example, we have a six-membered ring, so we call this cyclohexyl amine. And again, this nomenclature is just the alkyl chain followed by the word amine, so ethylamine and cyclohexyl amine. Now, this compound on this side is a little more complicated. We have some stereochemistry along the alkyl chain. We also have multiple derivative or substituents coming off of that alkyl chain that require the same UPAC rules for nomenclature that you've learned about previously. And in these examples, they're all given a different ending. So, in fact, they're given alkanumine names as opposed to just the substituent followed by amine. So alkanamine and ethylamine. So in this specific example, if we're to look, I see that this is R because the first group is here, the second group is here, the third group is here, so the stereoisomer is R. Similarly, I would place uh, this as the first substituent, this one is the second, and this is the third. Therefore, since this one is going back, indicated by the wedge, I know that this one is also R. I would count the longest chain, so in this example, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I know that it's going to be hepta something. Specifically, it's going to be heptanamine. So the end of this name is going to be heptanamine. And notice that subtle difference in the ending as opposed to the simple alkyl chains, which are just ethylamine. So if we went through and, and finished naming this whole thing, I would see that this is 2R, 4R, and then we're going to have a 4 substituent and a 6 substituent. So at 4 and 6, there are dimethyl groups. So 4, 6, dimethyl, heptanamine. Arylamines are typically named after the arylamine aniline. So if you recall previously, we learned about aniline, which is a benzene derivative. Therefore, we would use this as the parent name for any sort of arylamine that contains that NH2 group. So for example, in this example, I see that the primary carbon contains the NH2 group. The second carbon just has a carbon-hydrogen bond. And the third carbon has a chloro group on it. Therefore, I could call this 3-chloroaniline. Or I could also call it metachloroaniline. Secondary and tertiary amines are named very similar to how primary amines are named. In the first example, I see two different ethyl substituents coming off of the amine group. So I would call this diethyl amine. And then at, in the final example, we see our first example of a tertiary amine, but all three substituents are different. I have a methyl group, I have an ethyl group, 
and I also have a propyl group. And I need to place these in alphabetical order in order to name this amine. So I see that this should be ethyl, methyl, ice not isopropyl, but just propyl because it is a linear chain. So ethyl, methyl, propyl, amine. Additionally, if these were more complex alkyl chains, we would still be able to use the alkanamine nomenclature learned about previously. Let's take a look at one more example that's a little more complicated. Notice that this is a tertiary amine with three different types of substituents connected to the nitrogen atom. Additionally, we have a slightly more complex alkyl chain on one of them. Therefore, we need to be able to indicate all of the different things happening in this molecule to convey all the information contained in the name. One of the things that I see is that I can count the carbon chain for the longest one to figure out that this is a six-membered carbon chain. And also because it's got other substituents on it, I know that this is not just going to be something alkyl amine, it's going to be the alkanamine name. And because this is a six-member chain, I know that this is going to be something that ends with hexanamine. The next thing that I see is that I have a methyl group attached to the nitrogen, and I also have an ethyl group. Now, importantly, these substituents could have existed on any of these alkyl chains. So I need to indicate that it is actually attached to the nitrogen atom. And we do that by placing a capital N with a dash in front of each one. So in the example of N-methyl and N-ethyl, I know that that means that both of those sub uh, substituents, those alkyl substituents, are coming off the nitrogen atom. I also see that I have a dichloro, so I need to indicate that that's coming off the two position. So therefore, I see the last thing is the stereochemistry. So this is a wedge indicating that it's coming out at you, and this is going to get the uh, first or primary distinction when determining RS stereoisomerism. The next one is going to be a 2 going in this direction and then a 3 going in this direction. So therefore this is going in a counterclockwise fashion so I know that this is going to be S. So I'm going to begin my name by writing an S to indicate that stereochemistry at that position. The next thing that I'm going to do is indicate where all of my different substituents are. So, for example, I see on the 2 position that this is going to be 2, 2, because both of the chloros are coming off of the same carbon. 2, 2, dichloro, dichloro, and then I also need to indicate my substituents coming off of the amine. So, I will also include in here N-ethyl, which comes first alphabetically, N-ethyl, N methyl hexanamine. And this would be the full name S22 dichloro N ethyl N methyl hexanamine. Now let's talk a little bit about the structure of amines. The nitrogen atom in any amine is typically going to be sp3 hybridized. And because of this, the sp3 orbital is the one that contains that lone pair. And shortly, we're going to talk about the reactivity of amines, and largely this happens because nitrogen, since it has that lone pair, can act as a Lewis base towards other atoms or molecules. In other words, it can act as a nucleophile towards electrophiles. Additionally, I also want to talk a little bit about what happens anytime you change the substituents on your amines. In the simplest example, when you have ammonia, ammonia also has a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. And we have learned previously that the colligative properties of ammonia, since it has hydrogen bonding, the intermolecular force hydrogen bonding is possible for ammonia, this is going to give it a really high boiling point. Now, as we begin to change the substituents by adding different alkyl groups instead, so if in this case, if it was just a methyl group, this is going to start to lower the boiling point because you're reducing the amount of hydrogen bonding that's possible. In fact, if we are to continue going by placing two alkyl substituents, then again, this also reduces the boiling point until finally we end up with a molecule that doesn't have any hydrogens attached to it. So if this was trimethylamine, for example, then we might say that the molecule 
has far less hydrogen bonding, and therefore I would expect the boiling point to go down and down and down as we move down on these three different amine-containing groups. One of the most important features of amines is their basicity. In fact, amines are such strong bases that they can actually pro be protonated by relatively weak acids. By attacking the proton, this would generate new species where you have a protonated ethylamine and your carboxylate left behind. Now we can use pKa to determine on which side of the equilibrium this reaction might occur. So acetic acid, for example, has a pKa value around 4.76. And if we are to look at the pKa value of protonated triethylamine, we would find that its pKa is around 10.76. This is six orders of magnitude greater than the pKa value of this carboxylic acid. So therefore, if we're to think of the equilibrium existing as a double-headed arrow where the products could be formed or the reactants could be formed, this would indicate that the forward reaction towards this side, towards these products, would be significantly greater than the backwards reaction regenerating our triethylamine and our acetic acid. So we can use pKa values of the conjugate acids to determine the relative basicity of different types of amines. The basicity of an amine can be quantified by measuring the pKa of the corresponding ammonium ion. A high pKa for the conjugate acid indicates that corresponding amine is strongly basic, while a low pKa for the conjugate acid indicates that the amine is only weakly basic. This table shows pKa values for the ammonium ions of many amines. Now let's try some practice problems to gauge your learning. Then resume the video for a full explanation of the answers. To name the first compound, I'm going to begin by identifying all the different alkyl groups that are coming off the nitrogen atom. So I see that there is an ethyl group, and then there's also a relatively complicated alkyl chain. This brings me to step two, which is to identify whether or not this is going to be an alkyl amine or an alkanamine. And in fact, I can see relatively straightforwardly that this is going to be an alkanamine because this is a complicated alkyl chain. The next thing is that I'm go I see that there is stereochemistry, so I'm going to need to be able to identify this R or S. And the next thing I need to do is count which chain is the longest carbon chain. So if I were to start on this side, I would see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Therefore, I know that this name is going to end in heptanamine. Heptanamine. And again, we're using this ending because it is a more complicated alkyl chain. The next thing that I see is that I have an N-ethyl group. So that's going to be an N-ethyl. And then finally, I just need to indicate the stereochemistry. So the stereochemistry occurs at carbon number three. And if we are to consider the priority that we would assign to each of these substituents, the first one would be here. The second would be here. And the third would be this top alkyl chain. Therefore, I would say that this is R stereochemistry because we're going in a clockwise fashion. So this is going to be an R stereochemistry. So my, the beginning of my name is going to be R to indicate that stereochemistry. Then I'm going to put N ethyl to indicate that an ethyl group is coming off of this amine. And then finally, I just need to indicate that at position 6, there's a methyl group. So 6-methyl will get us there. So R-N-ethyl, 6-methyl, heptanamine. For the next question, I'm trying to determine the relative basicity of these two compounds. First, I see that I have a tertiary amine and a primary amine. In the tertiary amine, triethylamine, I notice that all of these alkyl substituents are electron donating. So this means the electron density is going to be pushed towards the nitrogen atom. And on that nitrogen atom is that lone pair of electrons, which is acting as the Lewis base. Therefore, I would expect that since there's more electron density in that position, that this is going to make this a very nucleophilic or very basic nitrogen. Additionally, I can see that for our aniline, that there are pi electrons that are conjugated in such a way that allow for us to redraw this as a resonance structure. 
So in fact, if we were to assume that these electrons would come down, this would push off new electrons to create a newly formed carbanion, where we have now generated a double bond at that nitrogen position, and we are left with a situation where now the nitrogen is partially is positively charged. I have formed a new carbanion, and I am left with another possible resonance structure where these electrons could come down, generating a new carbanion. And notice that when I draw my structure this way, that I end up with the carbanion at that bottom ring, and then I still have my positively charged nitrogen at the top. Additionally, I could draw another resonance structure where these electrons would come down, generating a new carbanion, which gives us a total of four different resonance structures that could exist for this molecule. And while it's true that some of them are more energetically favorable than others, the existence of these different resonance structures lets me know that this lone pair of electrons is not always centered on the nitrogen atom. And for that reason, aniline is going to be less basic than triethylamine, which instead inductively has three withdraw electron donating groups that are driving electron density to this lone pair of electrons, making it more nucleophilic. While we didn't cover the synthesis of amines in this video, I wanted you to have an opportunity to review content that you would have learned about previously in organic chemistry. We can turn carboxylic acids into primary amines by first converting the carboxylic acid into an amide by using thionyl chloride in the presence of excess ammonia. And this will generate a new amide bond by replacing the OH group with an NH2. Subsequently, we can reduce the carbonyl carbon using lithium aluminum hydride in the presence of water. And by doing so, we're reducing this carbonyl uh, CO double bond into a fully saturated primary alkyl chain with the amine functional group at the end. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions at all related to this content or other chemistry questions, drop it as a comment down below. I'll see you in the next video.